it just um, might be an idea if you have a mobile phone just to turn it off, just yeah, so yeah. the the. Done, done, done. <laughs> before I um, before we start, uh, I just want to acknowledge the assistance of the financial assistance of Limerick City and County Council. They're pr promoting um, the nighttime economy, so they're hoping to have events in the city on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night. So um, we, we made an application for them, so they're funding some events that we're doing here. This is actually the fourth in a series of eight um, events we're doing in, on the 24th of um, October. We're doing a reading of Requiem by Anna <coughs> Akhmatova. And uh, about a week later, we're doing something on how poetry influenced ten of the greatest rock and roll songs, okay? So there's, 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 there's variety. But I do, I do want to thank um, the City and County Council for their, for their assistance. So good evening, um, everyone, and thank you for coming along tonight where we honour Robert Graves. Um, one of the most brilliant lyric architects of the 20th century and we're going to explore the strong connections between Limerick City and um, Robert Graves and the connections he has with this city. Um, a couple of years ago I was listening to Arena talking about the Arena DRT program talking about Michael talking about Robert Graves and um, they interviewed Michael Longley who uh, stated that Graves overstressed his Irishness, okay? That really annoyed me. And since then I've been on a bit of a crusade to, to demonstrate uh, Graves' real connections with, with, with Ireland. I think anybody who does any kind of research will discover that the connection between Robert Graves and Limerick City is a real connection and a connection of substance. It is Bishop Charles Graves, Anglican Bishop of Limerick, for 33 years, until his death in 1899, who provides the city's connection with Robert Graves. <coughs> for on the 24th of July, 129 years ago, the Graves family here in Limerick was celebrating the birth of a grandchild. The grandchild was Robert Graves. And my grandfather, who blessed me as a child, is how Robert Graves describes that in his poem, age gap. The father of Robert Graves was the poet Alfred Percival Graves who was a very important figure in the Irish Literary Revival and was for many years president of the Irish Literary Society. And just finally, there are, I said there are many connections between Graves and Ireland, Graves and, and Limerick City, but the final one I want to make was in the summer of 1969 <coughs> the Paris Review magazine in an interview with Robert Graves, he specifically mentions his Irish influences and he says that my poetic system accords with the Irish of the 8th of the eighth century. So tonight, in, in addition to these well-documented connections which I have mentioned, I'm delighted to welcome the poet John Liddy, who will further explore the connection between Robert Graves and Limerick City. Many of you will be familiar with John's recent book, Areas of Consolation, which has been described as one of the most, as one of the most powerful po poetic homages ever written to the, to, to the city of Limerick. Areas of Consolation by John Liddy is arguably the most important poem ever written about the city. So I think it's appropriate this evening that John Liddy will discuss another poet with Limerick connections. He'll discuss Robert Graves' connections with the city. So, will you please welcome uh, John Lee? Thank, uh, thank you very much, Pat, for those wonderful words. Um, when Pat, just uh, by way of a preamble, I have about two or three preambles which I'll take <laughs> you on before we get into the collected stories, the short stories of Robert. <coughs> um, by way of the first preamble, when Pat wrote to me, with the idea of doing something on Robert Graves. An idea that took hold of Pat 
uh, after a visit to the Graves house with Kathleen, I think, on Mallorca. Um, I was struck by his proposal, Pat's proposal to me, and I quote, to do a reading from the collected short stories of the Limerick Connected poet Robert Graves, which reveal him to be quintessentially Limerick, with stories told in the way a man from Davis Street in Limerick might tell a little story. Now, I was struck by that reference to Robert Graves as the quintessential Limerick man, and the way he tells a story like a man would tell a story from Davis Street or in in a bar uh, in, in Limerick. That what got me interested in this. Um, that quintessentially Limerick phrase took hold of me and I was hooked, like Pat, on the idea of doing something about Robert Graves. Um, by way of another preamble, I have always been hooked on Graves' Limerick connections. Uh, ever since Seamus of Canada and some of you here will remember Seamus. I certainly do. Yeah. Ever since Seamus O'Caneda gave me permission to use his newspaper caption, Pound Devalued in White House, <laughs> for a poem I wrote about Robert Graves. And the caption was given to me by, with permission to use it for my poem with Seamus coined for the Limerick Leader article or Limerick Chronicle, I'm not sure which it appeared in. Um, it all, it concerned Robert Graves' visit to the White House in 1975. Very short poem, um, but it does uh, explain my preamble and my introduction really <coughs> to Graves. I had been reading him before I wrote this poem, but I didn't quite know much about then, back then, uh, his Limerick connections. But anyway, I got this poem, Pound Devalued in White House. It was suggested to the proprietor that he remove a photograph of Ezra Pound before Robert Graves and his entourage of literati entered Gleason's old world White House in the thrice-sieged city of Limerick. The erudite barman, understanding the critical implications of such a request, promptly placed the out-of-favour Pound behind a snapshot of local poet Gerard Ryan. There he remained while the eminent Don sat recalling the times when his father drank whiskey from the same barrel and heated his rump by the same fireside. When the hour came round to leave, Mr. Graves autographed a photograph of himself for Mr. Gleeson. Today it hangs beside Mr. Pound and still not a word between them. <laughs> no, it actually doesn't hang beside Mr. Pong today with the change of proprietors and different um, moving of photographs and so on. But it, it does sum up, um, it does mention Robert's visit, Robert Graves' visit to Limerick in 1975. So I thought I'd kind of include that. Um, but to return to the, the task at hand, uh, Pat sent me a copy of the collected poems, and uh, sorry, the collected stories, and I finished reading them only a few days ago. Uh, to set that quintessential Limerick tone in Robert Graves' stories, I begin with the opening paragraph of Life of the, of the, Life of the Poet, Nias Robertulus Gravasa. And it goes like this. get this right now. It's just a short paragraph. <coughs> Though some detractors are found who aff affirm that Nias Robertulus Gravesa was born of mean stock, his father being a servile Irish peddler of mussel fish and his mother a Teutonic feed freed woman, daughter of an ambulant apothecary, yet his descendants, on the contrary, claim that the Gravesay were an ancient equestrian clan of Gallic origin and that the poet's paternal grandfather was both high priest of, of Hibernian Limer, Limericum and a man very learned in the mathematic sciences. That is probably a nice little introduction to Robert's claim, or to Pat's claim I should say, to Robert Graves's Limerick 
uh, quintessential Limerick um, ness. Um, which is an interesting paragraph. We can then move to another story immediately after that, the Whitaker Neg Negroes, and these paragraphs bear witness to Pat's assertion. This is what makes Graves the Limerick Man and situates key books, the place where we stand right now, in Graves' reference to an antique shop that once beamed forth its wares onto Sarsfield Street. And it goes like this. It's a fascinating little piece, I thought. In the spring of 1951, when Riley had been 30 years in his grave, Julia Finnis visited me in Mallorca. Sorry, I started the wrong one. I'll go again. <laughs> January 1919 found me back again with the Royal Welsh Fusilier Reserve Battalion at Limerick, where 20 years before my grandfather had been the last bishop of the established Protestant Church of Ireland. Limerick was now a stronghold of Sinn Féin. King George Street had become O'Connell Street, and when our soldiers took a stroll out of barracks, they never went singly and were recommended to carry entrenching tool handles in answer to the local shillelaghs. <laughs> this return as a foreign enemy to the city with which my family had been connected for over 200 years would have been far more painful but for old Riley, an antique dealer who lived near the newly renamed Sarsfield Bridge. Riley remembered my father and three of my uncles and gave me fine oratorical accounts of my Aunt Augusta Caroline's prowess in the hunting field and of the tremendous scenes at my grandfather's wake at which his colleague, the Catholic Bishop, had made attendance compulsory in tribute to his eminence as a Gaelic scholar and archaeologist. I bought several things from Riley, Irish silver, prints and a century-old pair of white elbow-length limerick gloves left by the last of the Mrs. Rafferty and so finely made from chicken skin, he told me, that they folded into a brass-hinged walnut shell. The shop smelt of dry rot and mice, but I would have gone there to chat more often had it not been for a nightmarish picture hanging in the shop entrance a male portrait brightly painted on glass. The sitter's age was indeterminate, his skin glossy white, his eyes Mongolian, their look imbecilic, imbecilic. He had two crooked dog teeth, a narrow chin, and a billycock hat squashed low over his forehead. To add to the horror, some humorist had provided the creature with a doodeen pipe painted on the front of the glass, from which a wisp of smoke was curling. Riley said that the picture had come from the, from the heirs of a potato famine emigrant who had returned with a bag of dollars to die comfortably of drink in his native city. Why this face haunted and frightened me so much, I could not explain. But it used to recur in my, in my imagination for years, especially when I had fever. I told myself that if ever I saw a midnight ghost, as opposed to midday ghosts, which had been common enough phenomena during the latter nudistic stages of the war and less frightening than pathetic, it would look exactly like that. And here <coughs> again we have it from this shop, very place we're, we're standing in, that description. Um, this is an amazing piece, all right. Uh, moving on a little, um, I might add here that in uh, um, that Graves claims it's, it's an interesting claim and this is according to Luthia Graves his daughter that pure fiction is beyond my imaginative range and that most of the stories in the collection are true stories though occasional names and references have been altered he does jog the, the reader's memory with facts and places and detailed subtle references to manner of speech, local dialogue, and Ireland is well represented, as is Limerick. 
he ends the Whitaker Negroes with the line, but I am Irishman enough to coax stories into a better shape than I found them. And that to me is a telling line about Graves' um, Irish literary connection. In the story, She Landed Yesterday, the reader can see the writer telling this story in a bar in Mallorca, as a Limerick person would tell the story in a bar in Limerick. And you will see what, I, what Pat and I are getting at here. Um, it does come across as a story that I once heard, and all of us probably heard as well, who are standing here today. She landed yesterday. After collecting the family mail at five o'clock one Friday afternoon in Mallorca, where I live, I stopped by at the village cafe and found everyone disturbed and excited. I asked, I asked what was wrong. The Count of Deia is dead, Catalina told me from behind the bar. She and her husband, as proprietors of the cafe, know all the news. I could see that she had been crying. But I met him only a few hours ago, I exclaimed. He seemed in perfect health and full of jokes, though perhaps rather sad ones. Where was that, Don Roberto? On the path near the Astrock. At what time? Just after the midday Angelus. Then you must have been the last man to see him alive. What did he say? He asked me for a cigarette. I told him that I had no blonde tobacco, only black. All the better, he said. I do not enjoy smoking straw. I handed him my old sealskin pouch and a packet of cigarette papers. We sat down together on a rock. He rolled a cigarette and I offered matches, but he excused himself and used a small burning glass to light his cigarette. He said that this was a more economical procedure and besides, the son was his friend. Did he make any other remark? Catalina asked. That the son was indeed his only friend now. The poor gentleman. I had wine in my basket and gave him a drink. He took a sip and then considerately wiped the mouth of the flask with a clean handkerchief. After discussing a Latin poet admired by both of us, we shook hands, whereupon he went up the hill hoping that I would soon pay him a visit. He was found in the Asrock Reservoir at three o'clock. May his soul find peace. Don Julian hurried there, followed by the doctor, who tried artificial respiration. The Count had tied a heavy stone to his feet. But Don Julian, who was a very good priest, always ready to give sinners the benefit of every doubt, insisted that this had been an ill-advised means of reaching the reservoir bottom in search of a fallen coin or some other small object. In effect, that the poor gentleman was the victim of an accident. He pointed out that the Count's gold watch and pocketbook had been placed for security on the wall. Then, although the doctor at last pronounced him dead, Don Julian would not believe it. He bent over the Count, asking him to make a sincere act of repentance. No reply came, but Don Julian says that the Count's face expressed humble assent, and that he therefore felt justified in giving him absolution. The deceased will be buried tomorrow with the customary rites, the judge having now signed a certificate of accidental death. A great solace for the Count's family, I said. For what remains of it, he, he has an ungenarian aunt in Madrid and a second cousin, a nun, cloistered at Cartagena. The 700-year-old title is at last extinct. There will be an all-night vigil at his house. Yes, Don Roberto, my husband and I hope to see you there presently. Isn't that fantastic? Oh, wow. yes. <laughs> the way, the way they get round the, the circumstance. <laughs> um, well, let's see where I am now.
In the final story, oh yes, in the final story, uh, Miss Britain's Lady Companion. This is an intriguing story in many ways. We are given a touching insight to Robert's family in relationship, his relationship with his mother and father, who, re, who retained an affection for one Jenny Cooper from Castle Connell. Castle Connell. And a reference to a tower of Roach. There are also some kind words, curiously enough, for Winston Churchill. Um, in spite of his faults and painful childhood at the hands of his mentally insane father and daughter. And this is in the story. Um, he mentions a very interesting uh, snippet in the story. And not every man remembers his mother with deep affection, wrote Robert Graves in, in, in this story. But Robert Graves did fondly remember his mother. He writes, what I learned from my mother can be told in, a very f in very few words. She taught me to despise fame and riches, not to be deceived by appearances, to tell the truth on all possible occasions. He remembers her joy in making marmalades and jam and her frugality. In discussing his mother, Robert Graves refers to the father, Alfred Percival Graves, whom Robert Graves describes as being very well known as a songwriter. And to this day, we all know his songs including The Jug of Punch, Father of Flame, and Trotting to the Fair. These songs are full of rhyme, rhythm, and metre, and we can see where Robert Graves' abilities as a great lyric craftsman came from. Trotting to the Fair was a hit for Ruby Murray, one of the most popular singers of the 1950s. And Pat and I have decided that you all should sing <laughs> Trotting to the Fair. So, We'll hand over. <laughs> um, the song, as you know, goes like trotting to the fair, me and Mal and Mal Maloney seated, I declare, on a single pony. How am I to know that Mal's safe behind with her hands in oh that awkward, awkward way inclined? We have a recording, thankfully, which which would do a better job than I have. Just to conclude what I was saying there, the reader will find more references to Graves' grandfather, Paul St. Bishop of Limerick, and when exploring the family connection, I want everybody here today to spare a thought for the antique shop when browsing the books in key books. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was superb. Thank you so much.
you have copies of the, uh, the complete shot stories of, 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 of Robert Graves for sale in the shop. There's a small um, addition to the event um, tonight. Um, it relates to uh, a poem uh, written by John Liddy and this recently discovered, a manuscript recently discovered in um, recently. So I'm going to ask um, Kathleen McMahon to kind of make a small presentation in relation to this and, and say a few words as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I have had a cold, so my voice isn't the best. Uh, but I'm delighted to be here tonight uh, to present a copy of the poem Autobiography of the Fish by John Liddy, uh, dated New Year's Eve 1977 and dedicated to Marcus J. McInerney. I will present a copy, that copy of the poem, to Marcus's wife, Joan McInerney, so who we are delighted to have among us tonight, My and pleasure. his son, Thank and you. his daughter-in-law. February of this year, I was leaving through a book on Seamus Heaney by Helen Vendler, and out of the book fell a poem in, um, and the, the book belonged to my sister, um, Nora O'Brien, who lived in Brussels and was a very good um, book collector. Um, uh, out of the book fell a folded page on which was typed the poem, Autobiography of a Fish, the poem was dedicated to Marcus J. McInerney and signed New Year's Eve 1977 from John Liddy. Having known John for some time um, and heard an awful lot about Joan McInerney from my sister oh, who lived in right. Brussels, no. I was very curious as why the poem was living in that book <laughs> since 1977, <laughs> perhaps. Um, so, um, my sister's partner was Eamon Gallar, and he was the EU Director General of Fisheries, so there's a fish connection, <laughs> who would have known Marcus uh, very well professionally, and they were also great friends. Marcus. Uh, Marcus and Joan played golf uh, with an Irish group known as the Wild Geese yes. in Brussels. Um, a few weeks ago, another sister, Frances Maxwell, contacted me inquiring about a man named Peter Casey, who lived in Brussels and was a friend of Eamon. Very much. And uh, she was meeting a man called Gus McInerney, who is now 90 and living in London. But he um, supplies information uh, for an annual publication that she does yeah. um, on um, people from Templemore. Both Casey brothers were from, born in Templemore. Um, he supplies information on people who uh, went to London and when they died in their lives, etc. Um, she was wondering if he was a brother of Peter Casey, and he is. He, he is. He is, it, yeah. yes. Um, I spent some time going through Nora's correspondence and found a photograph of Peter Casey. I also found a beautiful and emotional letter from Joan um, that she sent to Nora when Eamon died in 2009. Yes. Um, and in it was her Limerick phone number, so I had the That's connection. That's how you got it. That's how I got it. <laughs> uh, in the letter, Joan mentions that she was now returning a book that Marcus had entrusted to her, Seamus Heaney by Helen Vendler. So, the mystery was solved My and God. the circle complete. That's amazing. That's, amazing. That's an amazing yes. story. Yes. Yeah. And now I will present the folded copy of the poem to Joan, oh, that's uh, as, it, as I found it in the book. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, a more uh, photograph of it also. That's so kind. You can part, can you part with this? Oh, certainly. No, I, I think it belonged, it belonged to Marcus. I know, well, obviously. It belonged to Marcus, okay. Yes. <laughs> so, all the rest. It's, it's, thank you. <laughs> yes. I, I might have just one little. This is an amazing story and I've just, it's just come to me. 
to the poem, my father asked me for a copy of an autobiography of a fish to give to somebody who worked in the Department of Agriculture or representing Ireland in Brussels through with Marcus. Agriculture and Fisheries Department. Right. And the man, I gave my father the copy and he brought it to Hanratty's Hotel. He was resident pianist in Hanratty's, or played occasionally in Hanratty's, not resident, but would occasionally go down and play there. So I went with the poem with my father and handed the poem over. I now remember. Wow. <laughs> I hadn't, I hadn't, I'd forgotten all that. You've yes. just mm -hmm. jogged my memory yeah. of this. So now I remember the, the connection with the, the fisheries. Yes. The man of the fisheries, yeah. uh, Marcus. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Great. Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. You're very welcome. You're very nice welcome. And yeah. it's, it's such nice a pleasure night. that you came tonight and I your family is yeah, so nice. Yeah. 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 Nora, isn't it is Nora. It is. She would. She would she love, love it. it. <laughs> she would be the life of it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, when I was going through her papers, I also found um, um, a poem on very flimsy paper. Destroying it. Uh, and it's um, song two or song eleven. It's two probably the, numer the Roman nu numerals. And it's um, by Desmond O'Grady and dated Roma 1968. Desmond O'Grady. Mm. Yes. Knew him very well. Yeah. Did you? Oh yes. His, yes. his sister was one of my best friends. Really? Yeah. Oh. Petty. Petty. Ah. Yes. Yeah. But well, this was among Nora's oh stuff. Gosh. And I'm just wondering how did that Get there. Get there. Well, we can investigate and find out and come up and have another small event. Word. <laughs> what a small world. Yeah. Yes. What a small world. Yeah. 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 And, and that's Desmond's uh, poem, isn't it? It, it is, is. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's Desmond O'Grady, Roma, 1968. Yeah. I don't know if it's published in a, it I'd have to troll you. It's not published. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't ring a bell with me in terms of memory. I mean, it could be. I, I don't know all of these poems. But if you could check the collectors yes. and, and yeah. the trawling tradition book, yes, and it may be there, but yeah. I, I, don't, I haven't come across it. Yes, and it was folded like this. <laughs> well, it was with, you know, it was with nothing, nothing else. Yeah. It wasn't out of a book. <laughs> um, I don't know. If, uh, I think Eamon did meet. Eamon Gallagher would have met uh, in Rome, possibly. Oh yeah, yeah. possibly, yeah. yeah. He was, uh, yeah, very fun man. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 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 So. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Um, it's the formalities. <laughs> I'm going to offer. If people might like to kind of chat oh. with Joan and with 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 with, 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 with John Lee and, and with Kathleen. So I'm going to offer everybody a little shot of vermouth before you <laughs> before you leave the house. Okay? <laughs> Which bit no, he could for the captain. Oh, you have one. I have one. Yes. 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 Come here. Okay. Let's uh, let's raise the toast to um to Robert Graves. Yes. And to um. John Liddy for a, a, a superb presentation here, here. of the connection here, here, here. between yes. Graves and 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 and, and the Brick City, well, and, and to Pat and, and to Kathleen and, and to Joan for making the and connection for, for a poem here. that was in, found in 1970, <laughs> written in 1977, <laughs> and wow. found this year that and made its way nice. back home again. Yeah. Okay, and that's 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 thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just, I've never drink. Nice. <laughs> <laughs>